Well, one of the highlights of uh, the spring meeting for the VGP part of AGU Anyhow is the presentation of the daily lecture. And uh, I realize you can't read this little summary of uh, daily on the left, but it's on our website. And I'll take the excuse to advertise our website a little bit. There's a little bit there about Bowen for our Bowen Medal, which we award once a year, and also the daily lecture. So if you can't read it and are interested in a little bit of history, he was an MIT professor, eventually went on to Harvard, but he was at MIT for a few years. <laughs> I, t I took the time to, to write a little introduction here and uh, to make sure it's coherent, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. And uh, although the field of trace element geochemistry emerged as a dis distinct field in the early parts of the 20th century, the field did not contribute to understanding the petrogenesis of rocks until first the emergence of modern analytical techniques, and it's really geochemists uh, who have been instrumental in developing uh, modern analytical, uh, new developments in analytical facilities. Secondly, we needed the development of theoretical approaches to understand trace element abundance variations in rocks and minerals. And uh, we had some of the people in the audience today who pioneered uh, some of this thinking. And once we had a theory and we had data, it was soon realized that we needed to know something about partition coefficients. That is, the equilibrium partitioning of trace elements between different phases. Now, the experimental determination of partition coefficients rapidly emerged as a specialty field, uh, but we soon realized that we didn't have enough time, enough graduate students, to measure partition coefficients for all elements between all phases that we were interested into, in, into understanding. And we needed a theoretical basis for understanding the partitioning that would enable us to, rel to reliably predict these without the necessity of experiments for every possible system. Now, Bernie Wood, our speaker today, and his group have been leaders in this effort, and today he will summarize the state of the art with the title uh, given over there. Bernie is a professor at the University of Bristol in UK. He has received the MSA award in 1984, the Holmes Medal of the EUG in 1997, he is a fellow of the Royal Society, and tomorrow, if you join us at the honor ceremonies of AGU, he will become a fellow of the AGU. His talk is here, and without any more ado, Bernie. Thanks very much, Fred. Oh, I've already. Well, it's a great pr privilege for me to be invited to come and give this talk. And I've got it the wrong way around. It's a good job I don't do experiments anymore. Right. Okay. Um, well, as those of you that are interested in trace element geochemistry are aware, there are many different ways in which uh, you can go about trying to understand or predict or model trace element uh, partitioning. And about 10 years ago, my, my colleague, or, or postdoc as he then was, uh, John Blundy, uh, got me interested again in, in, this, uh, in this problem of how one develops a model. And basically, we've been progressing rather slowly, uh, partly because you, you can't remain interested in the same thing for 10 years or once. Um, but what we've tried to do is to sort of decompose the problem of partitioning and to understand the component parts. So as we try and understand the physics behind the different parts of partitioning. Now some of this is published, uh, and I don't want to spend too long talking about the stuff that's published. I want to talk about as much as possible about the stuff that isn't published. Some new, new, newer ideas. Bruce Marsh told me he'd kill me if I didn't put something new into this talk. So <clears throat> the basic idea is these are the components of a model that might hopefully work. We need to, to think about the size and charge of the trace iron that we're sticking into the crystal structure, and that involves uh, an energy, whether the iron is larger or smaller than, than the, the site in the structure in which it goes in. That, that we have to strain the site, and that, that energy can, well, must come in as a term in partitioning. Uh, we have pressure and temperature dependencies of partitioning, which hopefully one can relate to an apparent free energy of fusion of the trace element component. 
And then we get to some other problems which uh, people have, uh, uh, have been very exercised about throughout the history of trace element partitioning studies is how does melt composition affect partitioning? Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is, is water particularly. What happens if we add 5 or 10 percent water to the melt? How does that affect partitioning? And the effect of uh, with high field strength elements that one commonly sees that there's a very strong dependence of partitioning on crystal composition. Okay, and I'm going to show how we can take account of this by uh, computing the electrostatic work done in, pla in placing the charge defect in the structure. Okay, so first of all, I'll start with a summary of this uh, Bryce model, which m many of you will be very familiar with, but I think it, I better just sort of mention it at least to, as an introduction. The basic idea is that if we have ions of a fixed charge, let's say 1 plus or 2 plus or 3 plus, then when they enter uh, a site in the structure, which has a radius R0, okay, uh, they will, uh, if the, the radius of the ion is larger or smaller, it will strain the structure. Uh, and that, that means that the partition coefficient for this ion well, this ion will be rather lower than the partition for an ion which has exactly the same radius as the site because of the strain energy term. Now, <coughs> in the simplest form of the model here, there are three parameters to think about. One is the radius of the site. The other is D0, which is the partition coefficient, crystal over liquid, for the ion which fits perfectly into that site, which has exactly the right radius as the site and E, which is the apparent Young's modulus of the site. So that the, uh, the Young's modulus controls the tightness of the parabola. It's, a, it's nearly a parabola anyway. So the higher, the, higher the, the, Young, the Young's modulus of the site, the tighter the parabola. And if the Young's modulus is very low, you have a very open parabola. So, so I'll just leave that there. And this is not new. This, this has been... Uh, uh, here we go. This has uh, appeared numerous times in the literature, and the simplest model is that of Bryce, which is the one we've been using. Now, in this sort of model, the elastic properties of the liquid have no influence. This is purely dependent on the crystal because the, elastic, because the liquids have no shear modulus. Shear modulus is zero, have no Young's modulus, so the liquids do not affect partitioning in the simplest form of this model. Now, if you turn to experimental data, you find that, for example, this is an old one, Bruce. Take plagiotase, for example, and look at partitioning of 2 plus, 1 plus, and 3 plus ions between plagioclase and liquid. You find that they do indeed obey this parabolic relationship. These dashed lines here are fit to the data. Okay? Now, the nice thing about this is because uh, this is a nice simple theory. We could use sodium partitioning to predict cesium partitioning, for example. Okay, if we know the elastic properties and we know the partition coefficient of sodium, we could use calcium partitioning to predict barium partitioning or perhaps radium partitioning, which is something no one, no one in his right mind would want to measure. Okay, so, so we have a very simple way of going from uh, calcium to, to radium. Just two parameters: the the, uh, the elastic modulus and the ionic uh, uh, radius. Pyroxenes, clinoproxenes show very similar behaviour. And this brings me now to one important uh, point that we found when we started to fit this model. We just took trace element data from the literature, trace element partitioning data from our own lab, and we just fitted probably sort of cheerfully, you know. Uh, uh, these sort of programs are very simple these days. It takes a few minutes on your computer, a few seconds on your computer. And one of the first things that, that jumped out and really uh, surprised us was that the apparent Young's modulus of the site into which the trace element goes depends on the charge. Okay, so we find, for example, that 1 plus ions describe very open parabole. 2 plus ions describe much tighter parabole and 3 plus ions is tighter still. Okay, so this, this absolutely amazes us that the, we thought this, we had a huge crystal structure and we're stuffing a little iron into it, that the crystal structure would, would control everything. 
but the environment around the iron appears to be controlled by the charge on the iron itself. All right, this was a very, so after a very uh, surprising result. Now, if we'd known anything about crystal chemistry, we wouldn't have been surprised, of course, but uh, it transpires that exactly this kind of behavior has been seen in the compressibilities of oxides. Okay? So what I'm plotting here is the dependence of the apparent Young's modulus, E, fitted to trace element partitioning data on charge divided by cation oxygen distance cubed. Okay, and for, for the information, not, not, I realize not everyone is, is to be into, into elastic moduli, but uh, the Young's modulus is roughly one and a half times the bulk modulus, or the, the incompressibility. So I've plotted here two thirds of E, or bulk modulus. Uh, and it was shown a long time ago, mo actually most of the things I'm going to have in this talk are at least 20 years old. It was shown a long time ago that uh, there's, a, there's a, a very good linear correlation between bulk modulus of oxides and charge times metal oxygen distance, uh, sorry, divided by metal oxygen distance cubed. So this is a straight line for oxides from Hazen and Finger. And these are the fitted values that we get from fitting trace element partitioning data. So you see that the, uh, the elastic modulus, the tightness of this parabola here, depends on the charge on the cation that we're stuffing into the structure. And the values we get just by simple fitting appear to agree pretty well with the compressibility of oxide, which is, is I thought, we thought, a rather impressive result. OK, the same sort of behavior we see in garnet, just for completeness. This is a, some experiments done by Tim van Verstenen in our lab. And you see that uh, garnet, here, here are uh, three plus ions going into garnet, and two plus ions. The two plus parabola is much more open than the three plus. And the reason why I wanted to show this is, is to remind you, of course, that the radius of the site into which the ion en enters depends on crystal chemistry. It's exactly what you'd expect. The site in garnet at the at, at pyrope at the magnesium end is much smaller than at the calcium end. Okay. So from crystal chemistry, we can predict variations in R0. Okay, so that's... The first part of the, uh, the model is the, uh, the dependence of E on charge, the dependence of, the, of R0 on crystal chemistry. And the next thing we need to know in order to be able to fix these parabolae in PT composition space is what the value of D0 is. And there is none, unfortunately, uh, there is no sort of obvious uh, theory for D0. So we decided what we would do is to try and understand D0, the height of the parabola, in terms of some simple thermodynamics. I should say that as soon as I mention thermodynamics, everyone switches off. So I'll try and make this as painless as possible. If you would just keep in gear for about a minute and a half. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm really at atavistic here. Nobody else is in the least bit interested in thermodynamics anymore in petrology. Okay, but anyway. So what we do is, we said, okay, let's treat the exchange of this cation, this, this one that fits in perfectly, between the crystal and melt as a melting reaction. And a melting reaction will have a characteristic uh, enthalpy, entropy, and volume of fusion. And because that requires some assumptions about the, the properties of, of the crystals and the melt in terms of activity composition relations, we said, OK, let's do something really crude and, and treat the melt as if they're uh, fixed oxygen units like jadeite, REENGALSIO6, uh, diopside, calcium shermax, and so on, when we look at pyroxene partitioning data. And let's treat them as 12 oxygen units like pyro or REE MG2A or 3SI2O12 or CA grossula or uh, almondine and so on when we're looking at garnet partitioning data. 
Now, we knew from looking at the major component partitioning between liquid and melt, that is from looking from at jadeite and looking at pyrope partitioning between uh, crystals and, and melt, that these very simple assumptions sort of work. Okay? For the solids, we treated them as, as ideal mixtures with local charge balance. Again, a very well-known uh, thermodynamic way of treating it. And we found that <coughs> This sort of model worked very well for the major components and for our rare earth components, which are the ones we've looked at mostly. And we also find that there are additional compositional effects. Everyone's going to say melt effects are important. There are additional compositional effects of the melt and the crystal, but they appear to be minor for, low, for ions of low charge. So, in summary, we treat the uh, D0, the, the, the variation of D0 with pressure and temperature, like a melting reaction and we ignore other compositional effects. We just use these simple 6 and 12 oxygen units for the melt. Okay, so again, if this... So it looks something like this. If we look at the rare earth partitioning between clinoperoxene and liquid, if we treat a melting reaction like this, rare earth, magnesium aluminium pyroxene goes to liquid, then, with a little bit of algebra, you find that the, you have a partition coefficient here, D0, for our peak. And it should depend on the heat of fusion and the magnesium content of the melt and the liquid, uh, and the crystal. For garnet, we end up with something very similar. Again, with just a little bit of algebra. And what we found is that these simple relationships, we fitted this side to that, we, we, we we took large numbers of data in the literature. Uh, typically, the way you do it is you have a neodymium or a samarium partition coefficient. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of samarium partition coefficients from some study, and I say for uh, kind of pyroxene, for example, neodymium would sit about here on this parabola. I take the partition coefficient, I correct it to D0. I do the same with lanthanum, which might be there, and with the terbium that might be there and correct them all to D0. I then fitted those D0s using this expression as a free energy of fusion. And at one bar, there's 500 data points here, it works very well. The absolute scatter means that you can predict the height, sorry, this is a apparent free energy of fusion as a function of temperature at one bar, corrected for pressure. That's just the best fit line. A wide temperature range from about uh, 1300 to 2000 degrees K. And that line fits most data with an error in this uh, D0 of around about 30%, which, when you take rare earth partition coefficients, which typically uh, span an order of magnitude for any particular phase in any particular rare earth, is not bad. Okay. Now, assuming that we can treat these things as simple fusion reactions, we then get to uh, a point that's been raised a number of times uh, in the literature since we published this stuff uh, and in, uh, in meetings and uh, in asides. And that is, what happens as you go increase pressure and temperature, let's say, along the mantle solidus? Okay. Now, whether or not trace element partition coefficients into a certain phase will increase or decrease as we go up pressure along the mantle solidus, for example, depends on the melting behavior of the host mineral compared to the heat of fusion of the trace element component. Okay. Now, because the trace element component has a, a positive entropy of fusion, D0 must decrease with increasing temperature. And since the volume is always, uh, uh, the volume of fusion is always positive, D0 must also increase with pressure. Okay, that's a, that's, that's a simple thermodynamic relationship. There's almost no trace ion that can disobey that relationship. D0 must decrease with temperature and increase with pressure. And whether or not as you increase pressure along the mantle solidus, you, uh, the pressure effect wins and D0 increases along the solidus, or whether the temperature effect wins and it decreases, depends on the PT relations of the solidus of the host mineral. Okay, so it's, 
It's simply the two effects. This, is, this has to be a decrease, this has to be an increase, and depending on that slope, depends, uh, controls whether or not your partitioning will, will uh, increase or decrease at the solidus, because the host mineral controls that. All right, so I'm glad Vincent Salter is here because I wanted to, to mention this to him. On my side of the Atlantic, that blue line is roughly where the mantle solidus is. And also, and it, it's a very important point, and, I, uh, and I, I'd like to, like to bring it out here. It's not an attack, it's just, it's just a point. Um, these blue uh, numbers are the D0 for rare earth elements at conditions close to the mantle solidus if you believe that the mantle solidus is about there. Okay, and this, this is a summary by Mackenzie and Bickle, 1988, with seven studies are collected together. Now this is either Kushiro's data, the Bristol data are here, here and here, and I see Caltech is also in agreement with us here for Baker and Sulphur. Now <coughs> recently uh, Vincent Salters and John Longy have said that the partition coefficients that we get here are too high for the amount of solidus, and they have experiments done up here. Okay. Their partition coefficients for rare earth are naturally lower because as you increase temperature, you have to decrease partition coefficients. All right, so our partition coefficients are roughly two or three times larger than theirs, and it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong, it's where you believe the mantle solidus is. Okay, it's purely controlled by the heat effusion and the entropy effusion of trace element phase compared to the PT slope of the amount of solidus. If you think it's there, then the rare earth partition coefficients are relatively high in declinal pyroxene. If you think it's up there, then they're low. Okay. So now I'm going to assume that you accept that this kind of elastic strain model basically works. It will enable us to predict the partition coefficients of uh, uh, heavy rare earth, say from light rare earth, or of radium from um, calcium, and that the simple model for the partitioning of the treating D0 as if it were a fusion reaction is also reasonable. Now, I'd like to consider what happens when we add water to the melt. As we know, the, the water will affect the uh, properties of the melt. It essentially doesn't enter the crystal. We know from experiments uh, many years ago, uh, from the 60s, that the water which we place into the melt lowers the activity of the major and trace components in the melt, and the liquid temperature for the phase will decline. Okay, very well-known phenomenon. Now, this means, basically, that the application of the model, as if the melt were anhydrous, if we just treated it as if the melt ran hydrous, we'll always overestimate D values. All right, because what you do is you're saying the temperatures are lower and D values all increase with decreasing temperature. That's, that's, that's uniform. So if we, if we lower the temperature and we treat it as if it were anhydrous, we will get D values that's much too high. Now, in order to correct for water, we need to know quantitatively how it affects the activity of the components in the melt, obviously. And although the water effect is unknown for trace elements, it is known for major components such as dioxide or pyrope. Okay, and I'm going to show how we can use this information to predict the effect of water on trace element partitioning. And just to, as an illustration, if we treat the uh, melt as if it were anhydrous, we, we overestimate partition coefficients. And this just shows you 30 hydrous data I took from the literature. They contain up to 48 weight percent water in the melt. If we treat D0 and ignore the effect of water, just treat it as if it were anhydrous, we calculate values which are substantially greater than the observed values. So, yeah, that's right. Oh, I didn't have it the right way around. Okay, so we calculate. 
So typically, so here, for example, this is one of our. Uh, this has a large amount of water, about 40% water. We, we're predicting values of about 2.2, 2 .2, and the observed value of D0 is about 0.3. So it has a huge effect. Okay, and that's simply because we've taken account of going down temperature, but we haven't taken account of the effect of water. This is another way of looking at it. We do this at constant pressure. This would be the partition coefficient at 1800K on the anhydrous liquidus, let's say. As we decrease the temperature, the partition coefficient goes up, has to. Okay, so by, by treating the melt as if it's anhydrous, we overestimate the partition coefficient. We always, get, we always get a very high value. What we want to know is what the effect of water is on the activity coefficient for the melt. All right, so that's what I would like to show you. We'd like to know whether the effect of water brings us down beyond the dry value to the dry value or not as far as the dry value. Okay. All right, so if you ignore water, you go up. If you put water in, you either come down to roughly the same value or maybe you go further to even lower values. So what we did is we assumed that water affects the major and trace components in the liquid roughly the same. Okay, so we said, okay, let's assume that if we add 10% water to the melt, this will lower the activity of dioxide component. It will also lower the activity of our rare earth magnesium component. And that the effects are the same for a given amount of water. And if you make that assumption, then it's very simple to show that if the heat of fusion of the trace component is less than that of the major component, then the combined effect of lowering T and raising water content while staying on the liquidus of the pyroxene or of the phase is to lower D0. Okay? And that's the situation with rare earth in CCX. So what, what I'm saying is that the heat of fusion of the trace component is lower than the heat of fusion of the major component so if we remain on a CTX liquidus, go down temperature, add water, we actually lower all the rare earth partition coefficients. And that's what you see. Obviously the converse is true. If the heat of fusion of the trace component is greater, then it raises partition coefficients. And if they're equal, then they stay the same. And that's roughly what you see with garnet. So if you go from an anhydrous liquidus of garnet, you go down temperature and add water, you basically do almost nothing to the rare earth partition coefficient. Because the heat diffusion of the trace component and of the major component are essentially the same. To show you how to do that, here's some 25-year-old uh, data, 23-year-old data. The effect of water on dioxide melting from Eglin and Rosenhauer. As we add water, we lower the liquidus. We know that. Okay, and we can turn the, these data into activity. From the enthalpy of fusion of dioxide, and we get something that looks like that. Doesn't really matter how it looks, but that's how it looks. So adding water, here's pure dioxide. Adding water lowers the activity. We just fitted a curve through that and said, let's assume that adding water to our melt has exactly the same effect on the activity of our rare earth component. And so we just assume that. Dioxide we know, it's a, it's a reasonable model. Let's assume that it does the same thing to our rare earth component. And we then used our anhydrous model for anhydrous rare earth, added this water correction, and calculated the partition coefficients of hydrous, for hydrous phases, for hydrous melts. Now, they're always outliers, aren't they? I mean, let's say they're always outliers. I can explain the outliers. These are very ancient probe data and you don't really know what the water content of the melt is. But if you ignore those two, the scatter here is no worse than the anhydrous state. Okay, so I can make a very good, I think, quantitative correction for the effects of water on partition coefficients and 
one or two of the points down here have over 40% water in them. So that's just based on dioxide. Okay, so what I hope you've, you've got from that is that we can, do very, we can do pretty well with some simple models on calculating how this D0 moves around in PT space, PTX space for anhydrous melts and we can use simple data on water solubility in simple melts to compute the effect of water on trace element partition coefficients. And I think you'll agree it works pretty well. So the uh, ignoring the effect of water, if you recall, looks something like that. If we ignore water, it looks like that. If we take account of it, it looks like that. Okay, and that's no that's a prediction. That's not a fit, that's a prediction. For garnet, we have rather fewer data, but it looks like we can do about as well for garnet also. I won't show you those because uh, time is getting on. Okay, so we've now reached a point where we uh, uh, started with our elastic strain model. We've got a model to explain how D0 varies with PT and X, and we can take account of water. Okay. Um, we now we, we get to the point where the actual number of data will get fewer and fewer, and you end up trying to uh, understand just three or four data points. It gets it gets uh, a little hairy. Um, but fortunately, we have students, and of course they they uh, will always do exactly what they're told without asking questions. Yeah, our students are just the same as yours, aren't they? So um, uh, we we are attempting to uh, increase the database. Now, as I said earlier, with this, this very simple approach, it looks like the crystal melt composition effects appear only minor. Okay, we can just factor them out with this very simple local charge balance model uh, and this very simple melt model, and we don't see any other any uh, additional terms, or the, the the effects are relatively small with respect to the the, the scatter in the data. However, it's been observed for a long time that there are much more pronounced effects of crystal composition on the partitioning behavior of the very highly charged cations. And one would really like to understand how ions like titanium, uh, zirconium, hafnium, thorium, uranium, and so on uh, partition as a function of, of PT and X. Um, but there are, very, as I said, these very strong, very pronounced compositional effects. And one needs to know how to treat those. Just an illustration. This shows the apparent dependence of thorium partitioning the clinoferroxene liquid on the uh, aluminium content. And you see that for a range in aluminium content from a zero to about 0.2, we have about two orders of magnitude variation in partition coefficient. And this is essentially at, at fixed pressure and temperature. So there's a huge variation in partition coefficient, which appears to have it's generally believed, let's put it that way, it's generally believed, I haven't looked up the original reference, whatever they say, uh, uh, it's generally believed to be related to the uh, aluminium content of the pyroxene. And we, we have to have some way of taking account of that. So to do that, what I'd like to do is to, to think for a moment of what a trace element defect looks like in a crystal. Let's suppose we have a calcium or a magnesium atom with a 2, two plus charge we take it out of the crystal and we put a highly charged ion in there. Okay? And we can look at it like this. This is my ultra simplified model. We can imagine that the trace ion, which has charge uh, Z sub C and is, is greater in charge than the charge of the major ion, which we've taken out, Z sub zero, has, it has some sort of disturbed region around it. It has an effective radius which may be somewhat larger than itself. It has a disturbed inner region which has uh, a Young's modulus and a dielect dielectric properties which are different from those of the matrix. Okay. So we're putting this ion in. It's going to be much higher charged or much lower charged than the, than the uh, host, the major ion. Uh, and it's going to do something. It's going to, it's going to really disturb this area. And it's going to we're going to require to do electrostatic work to put it in. 
Now, fortunately, the electrostatic work of putting this charge defect into the crystal structure, the form of it, at least, has been known for a long time. Uh, Max Born, 1920, uh, uh, applied this sort of approach to solutions, aqueous solutions, uh, and uh, uh, Bristol physicist Martin Littleton uh, used the same uh, model for solids in 1938. But the basic story is that if we replace the major ion with a trace ion of different charge, then we must do electrostatic work, and that electrostatic work depends on the difference in charge squared. Okay? So we have a, a, we have a parabolic dependence of the work done on the charge of the charge difference between the ion that we put in and the ion that we take out. That means that if the energy of fusion, the free energy of fusion was small, we'd expect that the, part, the uh, d0, the height of the parabola, might have some sort of parabolic dependence on charge. Okay? So we, we have to do work, electrostatic work to put the ions of the wrong charge into the crystal structure, that electrostatic work is a parabolic function of charge. So if we come back and look again at this model, solid liquid hydrogen coefficient is a function of radius, and we look and see how they, this is one I didn't change, Bruce, look and see how they, um, uh, the, the curves look for different ions of different charge, 2 plus might be here, 1 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, and 0 plus. For example, the parabola gets more and more open as the charge gets lower. So hypothetically, noble gases of charge 0 should basically all fit in perfectly into the crystal structure without doing any work at all. all right? Everybody believes that, I'm sure. Anyway, so basically then, if we correct everything back to D0 for the different charges, and then plot D0 as a function of charge out this way, we should see another parabola. So those d zeros should be a parabolic function of charge. And this is what you see. Okay. There aren't too many experiments in the literature where you have enough data to do this. Okay, so that, that one there is mine, and this one is from Paul Beatty. So it's two Brits. And uh, I, don't, I don't think there are any others that we could use. But anyway, you see a parabola. This tells you that the, the electrostatic work of putting that ion in the structure, we can add it on to the elastic work done. The, ele the electrostatic work appears to be an important component of the control on trace element partitioning. All right? So, and this is just to show uh, pyroxenes with two different aluminium contents. So, the, you can fit this, of course, with the Born model, and you find that the work done of putting a charge in is 30 kilojoules, kilojoules per mole. So each, uh, if you put charge 1 plus into a 2 plus site, it costs you 30 kilojoules per mole. So, <coughs> we got to this point about two or three years ago, we never published this because we couldn't think how to actually quantify this in any way. We had some sort of model which made sense. We see this parabolic dependence, um, but you don't want to have to go around from one phase to another fitting every one with some sort of empirical parabola to extract an apparent electrostatic energy. It just doesn't make any, uh, it doesn't really get us any closer to understanding the truth. So. So, eventually we came up with this way of doing it. Okay? Let's just imagine that trace ions, when they enter the crystal structure, they only enter sites where they're perfectly charged balanced. Okay? If that were, if that were universally true, then if we took a, an aluminous pyroxene, for example, then the local configuration around the thorium would always be something like thorium magnesium Al206. That's a, a charged neutral molecule, which is like a thorium pyroxene. Okay? Rare earth would always be in a neutral molecule like REEMGALSIO6. That's an end member, which 
from our parabolic dependence on charge cannot be true, but that would be a local charge balance model. Every time we stick a thorium in the structure, it never does any electrostatic work. It always fits into a, into a site, which, because of the statistics of, of atoms in the structure, happens to fit thorium. Now, in reality, trace ions find themselves in sites which are locally unbalanced. So we can extend this in a simple way and say, okay, if we have a thorium ion, then it might find itself in this, this configuration or with a zero charge or this one with one plus, this one with two plus, or this one with three plus. A rare earth might find itself in this one with zero charge or these with, with minus plus or two plus charge. Okay? And what we did is we simply calculate the statistical probability of each of these configurations occurring and then we weight them by the energy of each configuration because this one has, ch has 30, costs you 30 kilojoules to charge one plus. This one costs you uh, 120 kilojoules. And this one will cost you nine times 30, 270 kilojoules. Okay? It's a parabolic function of charge. It's charge squared. So we weight them according to their probability of occurrence and, and the uh, use of Boltzmann statistics of about 30 kilojoules per charge. And then we can predict how D0 should vary with composition. And, and these are some data, first of all for rare earths uh, from Gaetani and Grove about five, five years ago. I took their data on cerium and ytterbium and calculated an apparent D0 by uh, cerium is down here, calculating it up to there, ytterbium is here, calculating it to there. They are broadly consistent with one another. There's obviously a bit of scatter. But you'll see that if we assume local charge balance, that is that the rare earth can only enter charge balance sites, we, we predict a very, very strong dependence of D on, on the composition. Okay. Our, our initial simple model for D0 using heat of fusion predicts almost no dependence, which is also not right. But the revised version, taking account of electrostatic work, looks something like that, which I think you'll agree is not bad. If you don't believe that, then maybe you'd, you'd go to thorium. These are the data I showed you earlier for partitioning of thorium, or D04 plus, thorium is, is almost exactly the right radius. Thorium is almost exactly there. Essentially, at isobaric, isothermal, as a function of the aluminium content of the pirate scene, these are the data I showed you, and that line is what you predict from this electrostatic work and substitution. So what we can now do is we can use this approach to, to correct the partition coefficients from uh, at high aluminium contents or at low aluminium contents to some median uh, concentration. Okay, so we correct out this, this charge effect, even for high field strength ions like uh, thorium or uranium. And just to show you that actually that the major ions are also affected by this, the uh, calcium partition coefficient also de uh, actually declines, goes the other way as you increase the aluminium content. And the reason why the, uh, the calcium partition coefficient declines is because as you add aluminium, you make more and more sites which have 3 plus charge or 4 plus charge. And so 2 plus, there are, there are less sites which e are easily occupied by 2 plus ions. And that means that the partition coefficient for calcium, 2 plus ion, will decline. And these are the data from uh, Gaetani and Grove, and these are some data we had uh, in Bristol on the same system. Now these, oh, by the way, these are isothermal data, so we're not looking at a temperature effect. So, in conclusion then, after strain effects are removed, we can predict we can use the electrostatic, uh, simple electrostatic work done of placing a trace ion in the structure and predict the effect of bulk composition on partitioning. And I think that we're now, we've added to the, some of the other things that I've 
This is all unpublished, but I hope that someone will point out all my errors before it gets into the literature. I hope we're somewhere towards getting a, a comprehensive model of putting these things together with uh, the more imp uh, the uh, uh, important as uh, effects of water and uh, of crystal composition for these uh, high field strength elements. Thank you.